If two black holes are next to each other, what would happen? They'd orbit around each other in the same way planets orbit around the sun. I mean, the, the black hole is just a thing that has some mass. Let's say it was a, a black hole, you know, three times the mass of the sun, then it behaves gravitationally exactly like a thing three times the mass of the sun. People think that black holes, everything just falls into it. But of course, everything doesn't just fall into things. If you turn the sun into a black hole, the Earth would carry on orbiting around it in it's exactly the same way. It's just stuff. Is it? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. just to do with the mass. What happens if you go really close to the speed of light? What happens if you go at the speed of light? Well, special relativity, Einstein's theory, is built such that the distance between any two events in the universe along the path of a beam of light between the events is zero. No time at all. That's the way that Einstein's theory is built. So he asked the question when he was younger, famously, what would the universe look like if I travelled alongside a beam of light? And the answer is that you wouldn't perceive any time. The last thing yeah. I'll say, if you've got any mass at all, you can't do that. You can't right. go at the speed of light. So according to our model, which is a good model and it seems to work, but if you've got no mass, you go at the speed of light. So if you're a photon, you go at the speed of light and, and no time. We could go arbitrarily far into the future by flying around in a rocket very close to the speed of light. So we could come back a, a million years in the future and look at the Earth and find out what had happened. You can't go back as far as we can tell. A way to think about it, so in Einstein's theory, there are events, which are things that happen in space time. So that would be an event. It's something that happens. Our conversation now is a thing that happens, space time. What Einstein's theory tells you is it's about the relationship between events. Let's say that we wanted to come back here tomorrow. That would be another event. We meet again tomorrow. And you can say how much time has passed between those events. In Einstein's theory, the amount of time that has passed is the length of the path you take over space-time between the events. So it's just like saying, in a, in a sense, what's the distance between Austin and Dallas, right? And you'd say, okay, well, it depends what route you go. Well, what's interesting in Einstein's theory, the only complication is the length of the path you take between events is the time measured by a clock that's carried along that path. For the satellite navigation system, for example, GPS, the clocks on the satellites tick at a different rate to the clocks on the ground. Over 30,000 nanoseconds per day difference. They're in a weaker gravitational field and they're moving and all sorts of things. Light travels one foot per nanosecond. So that's 30,000 feet of position measurement if you drift your clock out by 30,000 nanoseconds. So it's a big effect for when you start using time to measure distance, which is what we do. If you're the carrying your watch with you, and you go between here and tomorrow, <laughs> you go this way, you go off and maybe you fly to Dallas and back. Someone else can take a different path, obviously. And so that a different amount of time will pass for them between those two things that happen. It's a tiny amount, unless you travel, someone goes close to the speed of light or someone goes near a black hole where the space time is all distorted. One in 10 stars in the Milky Way having a potentially Earth-like planet around it. This is a, one of my favourite photographs of the Milky Way. It's taken from the European Southern Observatory in Chile. Um, in the Southern Hemisphere, they're fortunate because they're pointing towards the galactic centre. The top of this arc is the centre of our galaxy, obscuring a supermassive black hole four million times the mass of the Sun. We're looking at a galaxy with 200 billion stars or so. We now know that most of those, the overwhelming majority, have solar systems. The estimate for the number of Earth-like planets in that galaxy, that's rocky planets, the right distance from their star to potentially support oceans on the surface, is of order 20 billion. So we're speaking about in terms of one in ten stars in the Milky Way having a potentially Earth-like planet around it. Now, we can't of course see the structure of a, a typical galaxy from within. We have to step outside. And when we step outside and start to look at local galaxies, the, the scale of the challenge of trying to understand the universe, I think, becomes clear. In the piece of the universe we can see, uh, there are something like, uh, roughly, two trillion galaxies. <laughs> we haven't counted them all, but that's a, an estimate based on surveys of the local universe. Two trillion, 2,000 billion galaxies. And each galaxy is, let's say, around the size of the Milky Way, some are bigger, some are smaller, but the Milky Way has 400 billion stars in it. It takes light over 100,000 years to cross a galaxy, and there are two trillion of them in the piece of the universe we can see, and we're very sure that that piece that we can see is a small bit of what may be an infinite universe beyond. We don't know, actually. And I always say, you know, don't get 
worried about that because nobody can picture it. It is impossible to visualize the scale of the universe. First, I want you to focus on a piece of sky that's somewhere around here. I'm going to zoom in on it now. It's a piece of sky that you would cover if you took a five pence piece and held it about 25 meters away. So imagine taking a five pence piece and putting it 25 meters away over a tiny piece of sky. Well, a few years ago now, the Hubble Te Space Telescope, which is in orbit around the Earth, turned its gaze to that tiny piece of sky, the five pence piece bit of sky, and took a picture. It opened its camera shutter for thousands and thousands and thousands of seconds and just gathered the light from that piece of sky. It was deliberately chosen because it's a dull, uninteresting piece of sky. Actually, from the surface of the Earth, you would see virtually nothing in it at all. But this is the picture that Hubble took, and you see that it's anything but empty. It's called the Hubble Deep Field image. It's one of the most important and fascinating images in the recent history of astronomy. Um, it's not empty. It's got lots of structure, lots of points of light in. There are actually over 10,000 points of light or blobs in that image, and virtually every one of them, over 10,000 of them, are actually galaxies distant galaxies. So they're not stars, they're galaxies. Now those galaxies on average have, what, 100,000 million stars like our sun in them, at least. So 100,000 million stars in each one of those 10,000 blobs. The most distant object in that image is 13.2 thousand million light years away. It was actually discovered in this image only a few months ago. Now, light travels at 300,000 uh, kilometers per second, 186,000 miles a second. And at that speed, it's taken over 13 billion years to travel from the most distant object in that image to Earth, to the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, when you think that the Earth is only just under five billion years old, it means that most of the light from most of the galaxies in that image began its journey to Earth before there was an Earth. And for some of the most distant galaxies there, they were over halfway here when the solar system was just a cloud of gas and dust. It hadn't yet coalesced into the sun and the planets and moons of the solar system. So imagine what that looks like. That's a tiny, remember, five pence piece, piece of sky 25 meters away. Imagine what that looks like when you extend it over the entire sky. Well, this is a beautiful map of the observable universe. Every dot on that map is a galaxy with 100 billion stars like our sun in it, at least. There, you see that the structure in there, they're not randomly distributed. It's very interesting. I'm gonna show right at the end of the talk that we think we're beginning to understand where that structure came from. Just to get some sense of scale, that little line up there, you might not even be able to see it at the back, but that's the one billion light year line. So light takes a billion years to travel from one end of that line to the other. This is the observable universe. And I'm going to show you, there's a ridiculous number that I have to show you. It's better to show it than say it. Um, this is the number of stars that are in the observable universe at the moment. 30,000 million, million, million stars. Uh, just like our sun, some bigger, some smaller. 350 billion large galaxies, 7,000 billion smaller dwarf galaxies. That's the observable bit of the universe. We have pretty strong evidence now the universe is significantly bigger than that, but we can just see this blob surrounding us, the blob from which light has had chance to travel during the history of the universe. But there are lots of multiverses, actually, in physics. One of them is called the inflationary multiverse, which is we have a theory of um, essentially what happened before the Big Bang, right? You, you have to be careful with the language. So if you define the Big Bang really carefully as the time when the universe was very hot and very dense, and as I said, you, you can't argue with that because we can see it, <laughs> because we can look out into the sky. Our best theory of how the universe got into that state is that there was a time before that, and it's called inflation. So the idea is the universe was it was there, in a sense, cold and empty and expanding extremely fast. And that expansion slowed down and stopped. And the, the energy that was driving that expansion got dumped into space, heated it up and made all the particles out of which we're made. And that's what we call the Big Bang. So that, that's textbook. It's a textbook theory called inflation. It made predictions, some of which have been tested. Some incredible predictions, actually, about the way that galaxies are distributed across the sky. Because they're not just random. If you look at the galaxies, they're in sort of flows and rivers of galaxies that cross the sky in a pattern called the cosmic web. And inflation predicted that. 
before it was seen, actually. So it's an astonishing idea. And that theory has a kind of an extension called eternal inflation, which is that the inflation essentially goes on forever. And it just stops in little patches. So you imagine the fabric of the universe, space time, stretch, stretch, stretch. And then it slows down and stops in little patches. And each one of those patches is basically a big bang and a universe of which ours is one. So you end up with this sort of picture of a, an infinite fractal universe of, of, of basically an infinite number of big bangs. And that's called the inflationary multiverse. And that answers some neat questions that because it, if, if you say, why is our universe the way that it is? Why are the laws of nature such that life can exist, for example? Um, well, the, the answer might be that all possible combinations of all the laws of nature exist in the inflationary multiverse. So then it's not surprising there are universes that permits things like us to exist because every possible universe exists in the inflationary multiverse. And that, that's a, a, a well-supported theory. It's a theory. So this is not the same as saying there was a Big Bang, which we know. This is kind of, what's a theory? It's a guess, basically. But it is a theory that in its simplest form has made predictions that have sub subsequently been verified. And this is a, a visualization of real data. It's a visualization of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is a project to map the positions of relatively local galaxies in the universe. So although in this animation that the points are exaggerated so you can see them, the distribution of the points is correct. So this is a fly-through of the local universe. And you see, at first sight, it just looks like a snowstorm, a random distribution of galaxies. Um, but in fact, it isn't entirely random, or it's random in a very particular way. When you look more closely, you see that there are sort of rivers and flows of galaxies. There are voids where there are fewer galaxies and areas where the distribution of galaxies is more dense. And that is indeed telling us something about the, the formation of the galaxies, the processes that seeded the distribution of galaxies in the sky. And that's telling us something about events that happened very much closer to the origin of the universe when there were no galaxies. The overwhelming sense that I certainly get from looking at visualizations like this is that the universe is big. Um, the current estimate for the number of galaxies, large and small, in the observable part of the universe is around 2 trillion. And it seems to increase every few years when more data comes in. But if you think about even the observable piece of the universe containing 2 trillion galaxies, I think the, the ambition of cosmology becomes clear, the ambition to understand where all that came from and how those structures emerged in the universe is a tremendous one. One thing we can say is notwithstanding the size and scale of the universe, um, the Earth currently is a special place, albeit physically insignificant, because it's the only place we know of in the universe that supports life. Now, we strongly suspect that, that will, it will not be the only place in a typical galaxy like the Milky Way to support life, but what do we know about the possibility that civilizations themselves are rare? Think about the history of life on Earth. Um, the Earth formed about four and a half billion years ago out of the cloud that formed the Sun and the rest of the planets in the solar system. And what we do know is for the first half a billion years or so, the Earth did not support life. It's called the Hedean Epoch. It's a time when there were no oceans on the surface. The Earth was too violent a place to support oceans and therefore it was a, a dead world. But what we do know is that pretty soon after the Earth cooled down and the oceans formed, so around four billion years ago or so, um, life began. The transition from geochemistry to biochemistry happened here on the Earth. And given that that happened pretty much as soon as the oceans formed, I think many biologists suggest there may be a sense of inevitability about the origin of life. We will test that, I think, in our solar system in the next few years by looking for life subsurface on Mars, life on the moons of Jupiter or Saturn that have oceans below the frozen surfaces. So it's a testable hypothesis. But I think that a guess may be that simple life, at least, may be relatively common throughout the universe. There's only one way to look into the wider universe from Earth, certainly the, the, the universe beyond our solar system, and that's to gather the light from distant stars and planets. And there is an immense amount of information contained within that light. Um, this is our sun. It's a, 
a tremendous, I think, video of the sun. It's not, it's, this is not a, a computer graphic. It's a real movie of the sun taken by an orbiting spacecraft that just observes the sun every day. Um, and you see that it's a, it's a dynamic and violent place. You could fit a million Earths inside that ball of glowing plasma, by the way, a million planet Earths. It burns 600 million tonnes of hydrogen fuel every second into helium. So it's a powerful, gigantic object. Many years ago now, stretching back to Newton and even before, um, we looked at the light from the sun and after Newton we found a way of analysing it by splitting it up into its component colours. So with a prism, essentially making a rainbow of the light from the sun, just as nature makes a rainbow of sunlight using water droplets. And this is a picture, a modern day picture of that rainbow. Now rainbows of course, uh, lots of different colours from blue all the way to red, but when you look at the light from the sun in a laboratory and you're very careful and you put it, put it through a very precise prism, then you see that it's not just an array of colours, it has dark lines in it. All these black lines crisscrossing the rainbow. What those lines are, are the signatures, the thumbprints, if you want, of the chemical elements themselves. See, what happens is you'll know that uh, an element is a nucleus with electrons going around it. And each element has a different nucleus and a different arrangement of electrons. What happens with the light from stars is that the light shines through elements in the star's atmosphere. So elements like hydrogen and oxygen and helium. And because those elements have different structures of electrons around their nucleus, they absorb different colours of light, very specific colours that correspond to moving the electrons around in very specific ways. So, for example, these two lines here are very famous, they're called the sodium lines. Sodium absorbs light in the yellow part of the spectrum. If you heat sodium up, it emits light in the yellow part of the spectrum. Why? Because of the way its electrons are arranged around the atom. So what you're seeing here is the, the signature, the fingerprints of elements in the sun. That's interesting in itself because you can immediately read off what the sun's made of. Because you can do an experiment on Earth, see which colours the elements absorb or emit, and you can look in the starlight. You can see what the stars are made of. But also, and this is the point for looking at the wider universe, something very interesting happens when you look at these spectrum, these black lines in the rainbows of the most distant stars and galaxies. So here's a distant galaxy. You can look at the light from that galaxy. What you find, of course, is that the spectrum is the same. The black lines are all the same because chemical elements are the same across the universe, except that in all distant galaxies, the lines are shifted. They're moved. They're not in exactly the same place. Now, one explanation for that, of course, could be that the elements are somehow different in different parts of the universe. But it's interesting, isn't it, that they're all shifted in the same way. And actually, there turns out to be a pattern to this shift. So what's the explanation? Well, the explanation for the shift is very simple. The universe is expanding. So if you look at a very distant galaxy, then you find all the distant galaxies are rushing away from us. Think about what that does to the light. What happens to the light is the light begins its journey from the distant galaxy. Light is a wave. You just imagine a wave on its journey through space. The space is stretching because the universe is expanding as the light journeys from the distant galaxies to us. What does that do? Well, it stretches the light. So the wavelength of the light is stretched. The wavelength is the colour. Red light has got a bigger wavelength than blue light. So as the light, let's say it goes from, it comes from a star, it's a, a hydrogen, let's say, emits a line up here and that journeys across the universe to us, it gets Actually, let's start in the blue. So let's say there's an element down here that emits light in blue. It journeys across the universe. It stretches, it stretches, it stretches. It moves towards the red bit of the spectrum because it gets stretched. And so you see the whole fingerprint of the atoms moved from the blue bit of the spectrum to the red as the light gets stretched, as space stretches. That's what we observe. So that's a very direct measurement that tells us that the universe is expanding. That's one piece of the puzzle. So just qualitatively you can say that tells us our universe is stretching, space itself is stretching.